One of the things I find most interesting when two explorers get together is we sort of trade stories. This is Life's Tough, but explorers are tougher. I'm your host, Richard Weiss. I love the outdoors. I always have, and I always will. I've heard stories that would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Explorers are the type of people who walk in space, go to the bottom of the ocean, and stand on the highest summits. Scratch the surface of any explorer, and you'll find they're all storytellers. This show is about their tales. This episode is brought to you by the Podcast Services Division at Life's Tough Media. Having your own podcast allows you to creatively reach all types of audiences, from clients to prospects, to your most loyal membership base. And by utilizing studio affiliates located around the world, coupled with quality remote recording capabilities, Life's Tough Media makes having a corporate podcast easier than ever before. Contact us for a no-obligation consultation at info at lifestuff.com or visit lifestuff.com to learn more. Greetings to you wherever you are in the world, and I hope you're well. Our guest today, Dr. Rachel Graham, is considered one of the leading shark experts in the world. She grew up in Tunisia, North Africa, and was Oxford educated. Through her Mar Alliance Foundation, she has done what so many scientists have tried doing, and that is to build bridges in the communities in which they work. And building bridges is a metaphor, obviously. Conduct cutting edge research in the field and also raise a family. Rachel, welcome to Life's Tough. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you too. It's lovely to so, be reconnected here on virtually. Yeah, so where, where are you right now? So I'm sitting just on the outskirts of Panama City in Panama. I'm two steps from the famous Panama Canal. Oh, no kidding. I, I've, that's, I, I'd have to say if there's a bucket list thing I wanna see, even though it's sort of a man-made uh, item. I just like the fact that, um, what is it? It goes from the Atlantic or the, well, Atlantic to Pacific, but it's not the East West people thing. What is it? it it's the it's Pacific. Or North, it's kind of Northeast to Southwest, kind of North, South. Yeah. So from the, Rachel, from the Caribbean all the way to the Pacific. It's magnificent. And I highly recommend that if anybody gets a chance to, to visit and the museum that they have on the canal is spectacular. So <laughs> you are, um, as I mentioned, a shark expert. And, uh, but one of the things that has impressed me beyond being super smart, which you are, is that you seem to jump between many worlds. I talked about that whole idea of building bridges with communities. So I've actually seen you in the field. I've seen you with fishermen. I've seen you with um, kids or, or, or students who are trying to get their masters or PhDs. You obviously have a family. And when we met, you were in Belize. And so I, I find that um, you're seamlessly going between um, connecting with people on so many different levels. So what, what is that secret uh, of uh, sort of connection with people that you have? Um, well, it's funny. Nobody's really asked me that before. I, I have to... I really have to credit my mother for that, you know, to tell you the truth. Um, my mother, Christine McCallum, is absolutely amazing because uh, she did her volunteer service in West Africa and went in as a geography and sports teacher, having been a high jump champion of Northern England and all the rest, and then kind of just went from there. And I have seen, and, and she would take me into the field when she was working in Africa and the Middle East and I really, I'd say that I learned a lot from her, just that ease of uh, working with people in refugee camps, for example, in Northern Somalia, to women working on micro enterprise industries in West Africa, Senegal, or Jordan, and then high ups, uh, decision makers, even in the royal family and the political scene. And I just watched how she, she just, like you said, seamlessly moved between all of these different worlds because she really had a vision 
of what she saw as equitable community development and one that really raised up women and that was her focus and so it's funny here we're talking about sharks and yet I'm talking about my mother's work and development but it really had a resounding impact on me and I took what I learned from her and being in the field with her and then transposed it into my love of much maligned creatures. I thought at one point I might actually even work with bats, but I also love reptiles. And then I had an incredible um, sequence of, I guess, encounters with sharks. And so became very enamored with the chondrichthians, so the sharks and the rays. And it, so taking what I'd learned from her and then uh, working a lot in the development field with various institutions, bilaterals, multilaterals, NGOs, and then finally bringing that to bear in the sciences. And I just feel that you cannot do, if, you, if your ultimate goal with the science that you're doing is the preservation or the persistence of these species, you, you cannot do it on science alone. And it has to be something that engages everybody who has a stake in the survival of these species. And so often what I see is that science is done in a silo, it's done in an ivory tower, and then people hope that the, the results of, those, of the science, of those data collected, will influence policy. But really what I've seen is that that is very rarely the case. And when policies do result from the science, there's then a massive gap between the policy and the policy makers, and then the people on the front lines who are really in the best place to affect the changes and ensure that there is persistence of species. So that is why I am trying my very best. If I can't do it, then I try to bring on incredibly talented, wonderful people like I have on my team and associates to then try and work all of these different worlds and bring them together for that one vision of ensuring the persistence of many of these threatened species of sharks and rays. I mean, what, what you've just said is so profound on so many levels. And, and as a mother, I, I'm sure you don't start your day most uh, mornings with somebody saying you're profound. It's, you know, usually, you know, get dressed, get out of the house. Yeah. They're like, mom, do you have some food? Where's the food? Yeah, exactly. But th that's really, to me, speaks volumes of you being able to jump between those worlds. And so the chief complaint I see with parents throughout the world, not just in the US, is that kids are so disassociated from the natural world around them or even um, distinct cultures. And so your childhood, you mentioned going with your mother to all these places. This is a remarkable uh, education, right? So has the way you grew up, and you met, we mentioned Tunisia, it, it's got to have been different than pretty much everybody you meet. Um, I guess I guess it's funny because I, I think I fall into that, into that bucket that is now called the third culture kid. Um, so, I, you know, melding of different cultures and in fact, French became my first language and then Arabic and I lived in a place that a lot of foreigners never lived in, in Tunis, which is the Medina, the old city. And so the mazes of the Medina became kind of my, uh, my rainforest as such. I became very um, knowledgeable about the all of the little tiny avenues and the back alleys and everything. And so I feel very comfortable actually in rainforest where I've done a bunch of work as well. And then I've skipped over to Marine as well. Um, but yeah, Tunisia, what an amazing country, absolutely amazing country. And the fact that my parents love to travel a lot, I'm an only child and we'd kind of all jump into the VW camper van with a pop-up top and we go, we go down to the Sahara and um, we would hang out in the Sahara and we would meet incredible people doing incredible things. Sometimes the last guardians of some of those threatened species. For example, I got to see an Atlas lion and they supposedly had disappeared by 1965. But I was just talking to my mother about this yesterday. And she says, yes, 
We saw one of the very last Atlas lions in North Africa, and it was down in the south near the Sahara, um, in, unfortunately in a cage in a kind of small zoo. So my parents were perpetually curious and they, they really supported that curiosity in me. And when I said I really wanted animals, lots of animals, we actually dedicated a room in our apartment in Tunisia to only animals, at which point I had 13 species of animals in that room. And my mother never batted an eye, eyelash, even when later I said, oh, um, can I have snakes? Can I keep snakes? She's like, sure. You and I have talked about the snake uh, phenomena. See, I um, anthropomorphize um, animals. I like cute faces. And I always felt that snakes were so non-responsive other than their tongue smelling me and maybe give them a live or frozen mouse. I, I never could quite understand the idea of raising snakes. And, and look, I, I know plenty of people who've done that, but how does that now, once you make that jump to um, Oxford, right? You're, you're meeting a lot of Tony English people there and you're coming from, a, a, I don't wanna say a feral background, but it, it was definitely alternative. It's, it's almost the American equivalent of the hippie family that went tra traipsing through the shadow of Muammar Gaddafi and Libya and, and the Saharan lions and snakes. What was it like going to Oxford? Oh my goodness. Well, I just wanna do set that, I wanna set the record straight in that um, I actually had the incredible privilege of going to one of the most amazing schools in North, North Africa, which was called Le, the Lycée Carnot. And if you talk to French people or people throughout North Africa now and you say, oh, you know, I was, j'étais au Lycée Carnot, they'd be like, oh, the Lycée Carnot, you know, but, <laughs> and that was a big school that a lot of people went to, but it was really, it was really, it's kind of on par with Oxford in the Francophone world. So, hey, it was an easy slip in, but there was a little, there was a little uh, point in between did leave Tunisia um, in my teens and I had the opportunity to go to Washington where actually I was originally born. And I, I was so, I was so happy to be able to go to the Washington International School. They were very kindly provided me with a scholarship without which I wouldn't have been able to go to. And from there, I, I did, I got the grades to go to, uh, to Oxford. So wait, were you born in America? I was born in DC. You yeah. know, and, 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 I've known you a little while. I never knew that because I've always thought, wow, she's got the penultimate great British accent. And oh, I, I, I bet you if you re reach down, you have a little Union Jack on your cup, right? Yes, of, of course you do. On. Carry on. And it's that stiff upper lip. So, so Rachel, what was the, or if there was an aha moment for sharks, what was it? So I think there was an aha moment for the sea. And um, I used to spend a lot of time um, by the Med or in the Med every summer in Tunisia. And it was spectacular. Um, and then I remember my parents took me down to, and I think it was around Kerkenna. And I'm trying to remember where it was, but I remember seeing a tuna beat. And they had every year they used to have the tuna come in and then they would net them. And it was, it was actually a pretty violent affair, uh, killing the tuna and there was blood everywhere. And I just remember seeing the fish's eyes and panic and fear. And I was just, I'd never thought of fish that way. You know, um, I'd been fascinated with sharks and fish from very early on when I was three or four, but that kind of, uh, twig my conscience and my interest and my curiosity. And I looked at fish in a different way. So when I actually plunged into the Red Sea in 1990, um, 1990, yes, and was surrounded by over 50 gray reef sharks. And, you know, everybody was telling you from Jaws, et cetera, that sharks are so dangerous. You're kind of starting to get programmed that way. And all of a sudden you have all these sharks whizzing around less than a foot away from you and you're absolutely fine and you just see how majestic and graceful they are. Everything that you had known is turned on its head. 
And it was so funny too, because at that very moment I was sitting out in the blue with all these sharks swarming and the rest of the dive group was stuck up against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I was in heaven. And that was my first aha moment with sharks. Rachel, you brought up uh, the, the movie Jaws, which incidentally the summer that that came out was the summer that I got my uh, dive uh, certification. And I so- 99, Richard. I, <laughs> yes, in dog years or something like that. Um, and I do remember the impact that it had, but I, I have to imagine that there was still a, a visceral fear of sharks that historically goes a lot further back than Jaws. Uh, there really is. And uh, interestingly enough, one of the largest great whites ever caught was right off of the north coast of Tunisia, no less. I only found that out later. Um, but yes, the visceral fear is definitely uh, is, is continuing to this day. And so some of the work that we're doing is really to try and change attitudes and behaviors and uh, through understanding of sharks. And that's really one of the key mission pieces with Mar Alliance. And there are many other amazing colleagues who are doing the same thing, because as you know, um, we're seeing massive declines in sharks right now. I mean, it's, it's one of the latest uh, pieces of publication saying over 71% decline in especially oceanic species since the 1970s. And there's just so many other profoundly depressing numbers coming out of all the studies. So a lot of what needs to happen is really changing that fear and having people recognize that these incidents are so incredibly rare and fatalities are usually less than 10 a year. And we know, for example, bees kill hundreds of people every, every year. What was the statistic in the state? Something like over 300 people are killed by dogs alone and just in the States. So we need to put things into context, but I think a lot of fear comes from when people enter the sea, they enter what is known as the, you know, the blue Serengeti. You're in the wilds. So you need to understand that. You don't have the same control as when you're on land. And um, they, are, they are the top of the food chain too, but there are so few of them now and they really don't like us. They want fish for the most part. You know, it's interesting in the area I live in, uh, not that far from Cape Cod, there's been an explosion, I guess, of seals, which brought in the great white sharks to the point where you can literally go to the beach on a summer's day and see a great white shark, um, you know, hunting off of there. And I've always been amazed that um, considering, and, and I actually went on a boat, I think it was two summers ago with a spotting plane and I spotted, I don't know, 14 great white sharks within a two hour period, um, all within just a few hundred yards uh, from the beach. But what has amazed me is in the last, uh, I think 70 years, there's only been one fatality, which leads me to think that they are very aware of their environment and their, and their prey. Yes, indeed. And I think there's, there's been some indications of cooperative hunting. I mean, these guys are smart. They've got learned behavior. And, and what we've seen also is things like when, for example, a, a shark is killed in a particular area, because I do work with shark fishers, the sharks don't come back to that area right away. They know it. They smell it. They, they know when there's stress um, and, and mortality. Um, and there's a lot of learned behavior that you see also in the work that I've done over the many years with whale sharks. How do they know when to come back to a particular food source that might be ephemeral or seasonal and really nail it? I mean, down to the days. So what cues are they utilizing to be able to find that food? And then they know when that threshold level of amount of food is not sufficient enough and then they leave for other areas. And like you say, you know, why are they going, you know, how do they know what is their, their favorite prey? Well, we are just not calorifically interesting to them. Seals are far better for them. And um, so, yes, I, they're pretty smart actually. And, and you know, I wanna, I wanna do a shout out for a couple of my colleagues, uh, Greg Scomel and Toby Curtis. That's who I went with, Greg. 
Yes, fantastic, fantastic work. And they've done great work uncovering um, the demographics and the movement behaviors and, and feeding behaviors in that particular area. And there's some really neat work being done by Dr. Carrie Yopak also on brain size in sharks, which shows that some sharks have really highly evolved brains. And you can tell that they have the capacity for great intelligence. And that's probably underpinning that uh, some of the cooperative hunting that seems to be uh, coming to the fore with some of the behavior that we're uncovering. So I want to talk a little about Mar Alliance because I think you've also engaged what I would consider cultural anthropology because uh, I've heard you talk about it. I've seen you do it, that you are constantly asking questions of locals, the ex, what you would consider not formally educated, but very aware of the environment in which they fish or, or work. Um, how is that, I, I, just in general, I guess that's in your DNA because you've done that since you were a, a, a girl, but how has that affected your research? So I, I always like to say that um, the people I work with on the sea, especially the, the older venerable fishermen, they all have PhDs of the sea and they have unbelievable knowledge. And it's that wonderful um, coordination of knowledge, local ecological knowledge and our more academic knowledge that makes for such a powerful team for whatever uh, you know objective a project might have. Um, I'd say that the local ecological knowledge that I've had the privilege of being able to gather has really helped to shape most of the work that I've done. And it also ensures that it's relevant. And I think relevance is really key. It's all very nice to have esoteric um, and, and really some of the interesting science that's come out, but how relevant is it for people locally and for management and for conservation and for that ultimate goal, which is trying to ensure the persistence of some of these species. So um, it's, you know, it's talking to fishers in Belize, for example, that made me realize, uh, that made me shape the questions that I had that turned, I turned into hypotheses for the whale shark work that ended up being my doctorate on whale sharks. And it was, it was that approach that I then used to answer a lot of other questions with respect to uh, sharks and rays. And also finding out, for example, the sawfish is, ecologically extinct. How did that come about? And then when was the last time they saw them? And, and that has then helped trigger a whole bunch of sawfish uh, research that we've done with fishers. And so it's that very powerful combination. And why? Because when we come back with the results, and it's more important for me to ensure those results come back to the communities and to decision makers locally than it is to immediately just publish in a paper, which can take two, three years, et cetera. No, I wanna get that back in so that we can really keep that wheel spinning for conservation. And, um, and that's, that's, been, that's been a very, I think a very, very powerful approach. And that's helped us really move the needle. And just to give you an example of how it's moved the needle more recently and how long it takes for us to move that needle um, is the ban on gillnets in Belize gillnets were considered to be one of the biggest impacts, not only to fisheries, but to sharks. The reason for the ecological extinction of sawfish, they were banned last year with a massive majority vote from traditional fishers. And, and, I, and I think in, in a, a big part of your persuasive abilities, people are not seeing you as sort of a colonial power coming into their country. They're, they're seeing you very much allied with, with the local communities. And I think that's helped you. I, I just want to switch over to um, the behavioral aspect of sharks. Um, generally, when someone is an expert in the field, you become very comfortable in domains that are not yours. What is it that you've done to sort of remind yourself that you don't know everything? And have there been situations where you say, wow, Maybe I didn't think that one through fully. I, I know I've had that mountaineering where I've thought, oh my God, don't be just stupid. Just think what you're doing. Just, you know, know where your hand is. And, and have you had th those kind of uh, encounters? So I would have to say that I've, I'm, I'm really trying to think if I've had those encounters. And I would say 
Um, I would say no. And I would say the reason why not is because I do try to surround myself with really good people who are smarter than me, people that are much better. I find that hard to believe. I find that hard to believe. But people who are, you know, much better at what they do than I am, for example, on the washer or in the, the fields that I work in. And uh, I, I'm seeing my role increasingly as the person who helped shape the vision and kind of orchestrate a larger team that crosses cultures and, um, you know, age boundaries, gender, etc., and trying to bring everybody together and focus towards uh, a singular vision. And so, no, I'm, I'm trying to think where I've made. Oh, look, I, I've always maintained that I've a made really good. Of mistakes. Oh my God, I've made plenty of mistakes, and and you know. Uh, I'm not going to get into your personal life now, Rachel. <laughs> Stay, you know, uh, shark based. Um, I think that uh, I, you know, I always say the mark of a really good explorer is avoiding situations. And my own father was a pilot. And so to this day, when I drive with my father is in his 90s, um, you know, he'll say clear left, clear right, the, the chain of commands and thinking through, if this happens, I'll do this and this and this. And so I don't wait for the dark clouds to come on the, uh, you know, on my boat. I see them on the horizon, you know, you, you kind of instinct, instinctively avoid them. So you're, and you're absolutely right. And, and just to pick up on that, one of the aspects that is critical to me is safety. And so, you know, everybody goes through the whole training. You've got so many people who are like, oh, I can't wait to handle a shark or things like that. Mm -mm -mm, that doesn't happen right away. Um, and not only that, being out at sea, that presents a whole range of challenges. And I have been in boats where I'm not leading the science, where scientists just push beyond the comfort zone of the captains and of local people. And, and, and they, they are basically saying, look, no, we should not do X, Y, and Z. And yet they push beyond it. And everybody's like, this is not a good idea. And it, it often ends up in... In, in problems. And so that's one of the reasons why, again, I go back to listen locally. They have the knowledge. If they say this is not a good idea and those clouds on the horizon are telling you, we're gonna uh, soon have a gale. We're packing that up and we're going in. I, I mean, I hope this doesn't sound like a sexist remark, but I've noticed that on those boats, testosterone is something that gets in the way of guys because they, um, you know, there's that mentality of being either, I can't get injured, I can't get hurt. You know, I'm talking about the guys in their teens and twenties that don't really think that through. And, and, I, and I found actually, um, as a compliment, uh, women explorers tend to think those things through because they have the lack of machismo. I'm not saying women can't be tough, but I just see a lot of male decisions based on let's go for it. You know, that's kind of the, the attitude. You know, it's really interesting because I, I don't really see that level of machismo with um, the traditional fishers I work with. They have far too much to lose, far too much to lose. And they're not the ones who are necessarily chasing after you know, that last data point and that incredible publication and that fame and glory and, and you know, it's, you no, know, that's, that's really, they're more concerned about ensuring that their boat is, stays the right way up and they get back to their families on the coast and they have actually had a good fishing day. So it's really interesting. And I think that's one of the reasons why I, I do have a really good connection and a good uh, relationship with a lot of fishers in multiple communities in many countries. See, Rachel, you just made an indictment on the kind of guys I hang out with. Maybe I'm hanging out with the wrong kind of scientists and guys. Hey, listen, we have a, a, a couple um, more minutes. Um, I just want to, again, let people know how they can find out more about Mar Alliance the Foundation, how they can get involved and, and, and really be better citizens of the sea. So- Absolutely. The website. 
Yeah, the website's omarlines.org and you can find us across all the social media from Twitter and uh, Instagram, Facebook, even YouTube channel. We've got some how to's, how to do this and that on our YouTube channel. We also have some downloadable um, v virtual reality films in case you're really missing the sea and you want to see what it's like to swim with hammerheads or various other sharks. So we really like to. I, I think the book I really want to read about you. Look, I, I respect you as a scientist up and down, but the whole idea of your story on how you grew up and, and really the influence your mother was and perhaps some of those secrets or observations that you're making for your own kids. To me, that that is the idea of building compassion and uh, the idea of empathy. And, and, and if we're gonna solve the world's problem, it's more than data points. It is compassion and empathy and not just for humans, but the world around us. I think you're absolutely right. And speaking of books, my, my mother did an autobiography called You're Mostly Welcome by Christine McCallum. So you I love it. Around. I, I am <laughs> definitely going to read that. And, and maybe you need to uh, pen part two of that. Dr. Rachel Graham, thank you for being on Life's Tough, Explorers Are Tougher. And thank you for really um, being the next branch of human evolution. You, you are um, a, a really great person and you make the world a better place. Thanks a lot, Richard. Well, it's been such a joy knowing you. And also it was great to have you out in the field and I'm looking forward to the next field adventures. Absolutely.